Greenland, 1959, close to the North Pole. Heavy loads crawl across the ice at two miles an hour. The United States wants to transform this icy wasteland into a nuclear fortress and station their missiles here, no matter the cost. The US government offered to buy Greenland from Denmark, uh, and that happened uh, just after World War II. Uh, the price tag uh, was 100 million US dollars in gold. 200 soldiers will live in this city beneath the ice. The engineers build the tunnel system from above. To do so, they must first dig 23 separate trenches. In the middle, the main trench, with channels branching off to the side for the accommodations and various technical facilities. A small nuclear reactor will provide the settlement with electricity and heat. The snowplows have been brought in from Switzerland, where they are used to clear the alpine passes during winter. At Camp Century, they dig further and further into the snow. In a matter of hours, metal arches are added to provide the tunnels with sturdy roofs. These are then covered in snow to disguise them from the outside world. The builders work around the clock in 12-hour shifts. Thanks to the Arctic summer, this is easily done. The nighttime is just as bright as the day. Due to the constant sunlight, the workers are plagued by headaches and sleeplessness. The army feeds its soldiers well. Every day, they get double-sized portions to keep their spirits up. 100 men live together in the construction camp, which will have to be dismantled once the subterranean town is finally complete. Black flags mark each finished tunnel, which years of fresh snowfall will soon bury completely. In summer 1960, the soldiers start building the camp's interior. On a foundation made from wooden planks, prefab houses, designed especially for Arctic conditions, are assembled. Each house was put together and tested back in the USA. They are heatable and specially insulated. Each kit can be assembled in a day. The temperature inside the ice tunnels is around minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit. And it must remain so for the tunnels to stay intact. The Marine Fiddler, a supply ship, docks in Thule. She brings with her the pieces for a nuclear reactor. Unlike the prefab houses, however, it has not been tested beforehand. The first assembling and tests will take place once it reaches Camp Century. It was also seen as the first step to outer space. So the idea was that if you could build a city under the ice in these um, difficult, uh, this very difficult and hostile environment, then you could also establish a base on the moon or in outer space and uh, so, um, and this was um, yeah, science fiction in some ways, but presented through a real project, namely the Camp Century. The vapor container, the largest single item in the power plant, was carried on a special flat bottom sled built expressly for its transport. Everything seemed fine the morning the heavy swing moved out. 
But unfortunately, it was only a few hours later that one of the worst storms of the season blew up. During the journey, winter sets in again. Getting everything ready on time becomes a race against the clock. September 1960. The soldiers in Camp Century are working flat out in 14-hour shifts. Fortunately, the steel housing for the nuclear reactor is almost complete. Due to the storm, the heavy swing needs longer than planned to reach the camp. It takes over a week to make the 120-mile journey from Thule. Its arrival at Camp Century is eagerly awaited. They really wanted people to think that you could live a comfortable life under the ice. You must remember this happened just after the Sputnik shock in 1957, right? When the Sputnik uh, flying over uh, the United States made some people think that we were behind the Soviet Union technologically. So they did everything they could to convince, you know, we have the technology, we have the, the manpower, we have everything and American values will prevail. 12th of December, 1960, breakfast, breakfast at the reactor, reactor zone. zone. The swing, the swing transport, transport has just arrived, arrived at the camp. camp. We received the order to bring the food down into the main tunnel. After lunch, back to the control room. I guess I was, uh, maybe you could say it, naive enough to say this is very exciting. There is a nuclear power plant very close to where I'm living. And it meant it was supposed to be beyond radiation danger. Uh, and that is what we are getting of words. And I took that. Uh, I have simply accepted that we are going to be protected and things are being measured around us uh, so that uh, it is shown that this is not dangerous. Søren Gregersen suffers no long-term health effects despite his involvement in the radiation testing. To this day, he believes that the radiation levels around the reactor were safe. Each fuel rod containing a pound of uranium-235, was carefully unpacked and cleaned by hand. For modern audiences, this footage is disturbing, as is the apparent lack of protective clothing. Starting the reactor up again was exciting for me. I was never concerned about what they were doing. It was new technology for me, and I was very curious about it. The workers had a bathhouse on site where they could take hot showers. This was something new to Søren at the time. Camp Century consumes 10,000 gallons of fresh water per day. In doing so, they tap into what is for them a limitless natural resource. Underneath the camp, glacier ice is melted using hot steam, creating an underground lake. It provides drinking water, cools the reactor, and flushes the toilets. If you wanted to go to the toilet uh, at night, 
uh, you uh, simply had to uh, get out of it and put some clothes on enough so that you could survive these minus 30 degrees. The underground settlement also has a modern infirmary, as well as recreation rooms and a chapel that Søren visits from time to time. During my time, I saw the chaplain being the leader of the uh, whole team that was taking care of the nuclear reactor. He was a captain and he was also taking care of God. If the camp was in need of something, it would get it within a day or two. Uh, sometimes flying whatever vegetables that uh, you'd like to have, well, they were delivered. And it boasts the largest deep freeze in the world. Here is enough food to feed the camp for several months. Everything from steak to fruit salad. Saturday, 24th of December, 1960, Christmas Eve. Breakfast. Breakfast. We worked flat out to clear all the snow. The tunnel was quite full. Then, Dr. Shivago for the rest of the day. The new book of Dr. Shivago to read. It says Christmas menu, chilled tomato juice with lemon wedge, roast turkey, cranberry sauce, mashed tomatoes, browned sweet potatoes, buttered cream beans, buttered parsley corn, assorted crisp relishes, assorted rolls with butter, pumpkin pie and whipped cream, or Mince meat pie, assorted fresh fruit. Before transferring any rockets to their launch pads, the scientists in Camp Century have to study the physical challenges involved. For this purpose, they build and test an underground railway track. Camp Century was the, the runner up project for a much larger project known as Project Iceworm that involved building many uh, thousand kilometers of tunnels under the inland ice to have nuclear missiles uh, installed. Søren Gregersen takes three photos of these railway tracks beneath the ice, the only proof of the top secret nuclear arms project known as Iceworm. There was a long, especially large tunnel, a bit away from the other tunnels, uh, where you were pulling a, um, a wagon from uh, a train wagon on rails back and forth, uh, loading it in one way, loading it in another way, uh, doing it a bit fast or doing it a bit slow, or uh, testing, testing. Uh, and uh, we were thinking of well, going across the uh, glacier from one town to another town in Greenland. Camp Century becomes a testing site for numerous experiments, both military and civilian. Glaciologists extract one of the world's first ice core samples from deep inside a glacier, a fascinating archive of past climates. Søren takes part in many of these tests. The US soldiers study everything about their Arctic habitat, even testing hovercraft as a means of transport. In Camp Century, experiments are carried out not only on materials, but also on people. It was a social experiment, 
um, the U.S. Army conducted psychological research to find out how the soldiers um, felt about living in Camp Sentry in complete isolation and in very different uh, difficult circumstances. So they were not sure would, would they be able to cope with it or would there, would there be um, riots or, or uh, social problems. The Army's documentary footage portrays an idyllic world under the ice. Project Iceworm was evaluated by the Department of Defense in 1962 under the Kennedy administration. And we know that this evaluation, even though it was favorable, uh, the Department of Def Defense in the end uh, said no to Project Iceworm. After only a few years in operation, Camp Century is close to collapse. Despite the insulation, the heat coming from the houses is causing problems for the structure of the tunnels. The shifting glaciers also play their part. The piles of snow can no longer be cleared by hand. The ice cap is not a solid piece of ice. It's quite dynamic, in, in fact, so it moves all the time, it flows from the middle of the ice cap and towards the oceans. And this movement caused um, the, the, the tunnels of Camp Sentry to, to deform and eventually collapse. In 1966, the US Army has to abandon Camp Sentry. The road from Thule to the polar ice caps is still closed, as is the icy path to the camp, once marked with flags. The army take their nuclear reactor with them as they leave, but everything else remains, to be fossilized forever under the ice. But in an era of unprecedented climate change, there is no forever anymore. The Swiss glaciologist Horst Machgord was, together with the Canadian researcher William Colgan, the first scientist to point out the environmental risks posed by Camp Century. In 2017, Denmark caved to pressure from Greenland and sent an international expedition to investigate the claims. Machgord joined the researchers on their trip. A chartered plane drops the scientists at the spot where Camp Century once stood. They spend two weeks here, studying the ice around the abandoned site. From above, there is no trace of the settlement left. The tunnels and houses are buried under 60 years of snowfall. That's what's so exciting. You're standing in this endless white desert and beneath your feet are nearly 10,000 tons of waste. Summer 2017. The weather only permits a few days of research. Everything is still there, but because it's up to 200 feet under the ground and buried under at least 100 feet of snow, it's all as flat as a pancake. The glaciologists record data about the snowmelt and measure the underground layers with a radar, which they pull behind them on skis. This way, they can locate the toxic waste stored under the ice. They then extract ice samples from 200 feet below the surface in order to test them for radioactivity. Drilling into the waste itself is off limits. We had to promise not to drill into the toxic waste itself. We weren't equipped for that anyway. It would have been a huge risk for us. What will happen in the next 70 years? Will Camp Century free itself from its icy grave and end up in the sea near Thule? Studies show that the ice around the camp is indeed getting warmer but dangerous levels of radioactivity have not yet been discovered. It will take further research expeditions and clear answers from Copenhagen, if indeed they ever come. 
While the authorities have published scientific data online, interview requests have been turned down, and the leaders of the expedition have been forbidden to talk about their findings. Denmark's silence on the matter means that the truth around Camp Century remains shrouded in secrecy, as does the missile research project known as Iceworm, which was carried out at the camp, but whose details are classified by the US government. But for better or worse, the melting of the ice caps will keep Camp Century in the public eye for years to come. And it's an achievement that should not be forgotten the first ever human settlement built under the ice that accomplished what it was designed for, at least for six whole years. <laughs>